Welcome, everybody. And depending on where you are in the world today, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're in for a special session today featuring speakers from all over the world joining at all sorts of times of the day. Today's discussion and session is around the topic of competing worldviews concerning Korean reunification. How much will they be a factor in the outcome? We have an esteemed group of panelists today that I will briefly introduce. And before I do that, I want to remind all of our audience members that we have an interpretation option available. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a world icon. And if you click on that, you can choose the appropriate language for you. We have interpretation both in Russian and English. And one of our speakers will be speaking in Russian today. So I encourage you to go ahead and open your interpretation and turn on your English interpretation at this time. So we have five amazing panelists joining us today. First, we have Honorable Dr. Yevgeny Kim, who is the leading researcher at the Center for Korean Studies at the Institute of the Far East at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Russia. We also have Mr. Michael Breen, who is an author, commentator from South Korea, and is also the CEO of Insight Communication Consultants. He was the former president of the Seoul Foreign Correspondence Club. We have Mr. Torbjorn Ferovic, who is a historian, journalist, and author, and a specialist on East Asia coming to us from Norway. And we have Dr. Thomas Ward, who is the president of the Unification Theological Ceremony Seminary in the United States. And finally, we also have Mr. Bruce Klingner, who is the Senior Research Fellow for Northeast Asia in the Asian Studies Center from the Heritage Foundation and the United States. Welcome to all of our panelists today. I'm looking forward to a great session. First, we're gonna hear from each of our panelists who will speak for seven to eight minutes, and then we will open up our group to Q&A and discussion together. So throughout the presentations today for our audience members, if you have questions coming up, please go ahead and use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's two chat box windows next to each other that says Q&A, and you can type your questions in there. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible today. So for our first speaker today, I would like to welcome Mr. Michael Breen. Mr. Breen is an author and commentator on Korean issues based in South Korea and is a graduate of the University of Edinburgh. Mr. Breen is a former correspondent for the Washington Times and The Guardian and the past president of the Seoul, for Seoul for Foreign Correspondence Club. He is currently the CEO of Insight Communications Consultants a business consul consultancy in Seoul. He also writes for the Ch Chosun Ilbo and the Korea Times newspaper. He's an author of four books on Korea, the most recent of which is The New Koreans. He was made an honorary citizen of Seoul in 2001. Mr. Green, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kaylee, um, and hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk um, uh, about the question of values at the heart of this issue of Korean un reunification. It's sort of a subject we don't often touch, but I think it's very important. Um, and as I was preparing for this, I was reminded of a, a press conference I intended in Seoul uh, in the wake of German reunification about 30 years ago. And at that press conference, a South Korean journalist asked the West German or the German New German ambassador, um, if he thought that the two Koreas would be allowed by foreign powers to reunify as Germany had. Um, and the, the ambassador said, um, you will not need permission. No country can object to Korean unification, he said. And then he added rather mystically, um, explaining his reason. You see, um, excuse me, I'm just, something's just come up on my screen. There we go. Um, uh, he said, you see, we Germans were divided because of our sin, and you Koreans were divided because of your innocence. And that's why foreign powers have no uh, moral basis to object to your unification. 
And there's a lot to sort of dig out in that comment, but the part that's always interested me living out in Korea um, is how it underscores the prime role of the Koreans themselves in their own reunification. Um, if foreign powers have no morally acceptable argument to block their reunification, then it's up to the Koreans to do it themselves. And as they haven't, then it logically follows that they don't want to, at least not yet. Uh, and what I mean by this is that, uh, of course, you know, reunification is important. Uh, both sides say they want it, um, but there must be something that's more important to them. Uh, and as to what this is, I think the, the answer is quite obvious, um, but as is the way with political things, uh, the deeper that an assumption is planted, the less likely it is to be articulated. And we need to be clear about these things, however, because unarticulated assumptions lead us to act at cross purposes and to misunderstand one another. And that thing that I'm uh, talking about that I think is more important than reunification for the Koreans is national values. So what do I mean by this? Um, simply, I mean those things that a community places most value on. What is most important for us? For example, in secular democracies, we tend to place greatest value on family, the quality of our lives, freedom of religion, freedom of thought and expression, opportunity, fairness, the right to vote, our trust in institutions, our trust in our neighbors and so on. These all matter more to us than some political arrangement. Or to put it another way, we want our political arrangements to be structured so that they protect us and make it possible to have those things that we value. So in this picture, in this scheme, if you like, the reunification for the Koreans seems like a lofty vision to aspire to. But I would say that in this context, it's not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. It's not the vision, but it's the strategy to reach the vision of a state with a system that embodies and protects the values that they cherish. Now, this may seem like a, a fussy point. It may even seem a little bit flaky in a sense, um, particularly if you take at face value what Koreans say about being one blood and one history and one language and all of that. But the truth of the matter is that political unity is not a matter of race, language, or shared history. The North Koreans and the South Koreans remain apart because they have conflicting values. And reunification in such circumstances can only happen by force. So what are the values of these rival Korean states? Let's take North Korea, for example. Unlike other communist revolutions, which were conceived as internal class struggles and which swept away the past, Kim Il-sung's revolution in North Korea was anti-imperialist. It involved not sweeping away the Korean past, but liberating it. And that's why their philosophy of self-reliance, Juche in Korean, essentially is a way of saying up yours to foreigners. To sustain his revolution, Kim said, the Koreans need, the North Koreans need a strong leader. And as a result in North Korea, the leader is the state, the person of Kim Jong-un, the grandson of the, the founder, is more important than all of the nation's institutions and symbols. And this state of his values obedience, loyalty, and the collective over the individual. And enough people buy into this to keep the system in place. South Koreans couldn't be more different. Their values are those of modern democracies, freedom, justice, rights, equal opportunity, primacy of the individual, and so on. Uh, and you might assume as Koreans are nationalistic that love of country is a value. This is true, but the South Koreans are split on their concept of the country. 
uh, it's useful to bear in mind that this, this is the main issue that separates the democratic right and left in South Korea. The right is loyal to the Republic of Korea formed in 1948 and sees the eventual reunified state as an expanded version of their country. The left is loyal to a Korea that has its roots in the struggle against Japanese colonial rule. And it, this nation is still in the womb and is yet to be born. As for other stakeholders, well, I'll let, uh, I see Kylie has uh, popped up, so I've only got a minute to go. Um, I'll let other speakers talk about other stakeholders, but just one point, I think the values of other stakeholder countries, I think are less important than their interests, which I think other speakers will talk to. And just very, very quickly, let me conclude by saying I have two recommendations, two steps. One is that in talking about Korean unification, we identify the desired vision. This is a no brainer. That vision is for a unified Korea that's a law based democracy with a free market economic system. So we have to reject the North Korean system and we have to reject any fantasies about a hybrid system. Step two is to expand that vision to include the region of Northeast Asia. So America and its allies should articulate this vision of a region whose countries are law-based democracies with free market systems. Um, and step three is where strategy and tactics come in and we can argue about this. I say we tie down the North Koreans in all kinds of talks and exchanges, not because they'll lead to unification, but because we need to distract them and stop them misbehaving. And then we need to wait for the power shift that will lead to the change in values that will create the conditions for real reunification. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. No, thank you so much, thank Mr. Breen. That was excellent. Good timing and very intriguing points, especially this last one about widening the net to include Northeast Asia in this whole conversation. Thank you for representing the Korean perspective as a honorary citizen of South Korea. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to our next panelist, Dr. Yevgeny Kim. Dr. Yevgeny was a deputy of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, chairman of the steering subcommittee, and member of the Committee on International Affairs, the deputy chairman of the Committee on the State Building, and assistant to the deputy of the State Duma in the IFES since 2003. Dr. Kim can often be seen on various federal channels as an expert on the Korean Peninsula and is currently the leading researcher at the Center for Korean Studies in the Institute of the Far East at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for joining us all the way from Russia. The floor is yours. Крупный специалист по корейским делам. Хочу отметить, что многие идеи, которые сейчас высказал господин Майкл Брин, они в определенной степени созвучны с тем, что я думаю по поводу корейских дел. Я хотел бы тоже сделать небольшой экскурс в историю. 28 лет назад я выступал на семинаре членов консультативного комитета по мирному демократическому объединению Кореи в Сеуле. Это орган президентской структуры, это конституционный орган и формируется президентом Южной Кореи. Так вот, это был семинар членов этого комитета. Я там выступал после того, как я послушал некоторые выступления для членов этого комитета, которые говорили, что вот Кемерсен, он мешает объединению, он слишком долго сидит, он быстрее бы умер, и после этого бы сразу наступит объединение. Я им тогда сказал, что вы не дождетесь этого, по той причине, что северокорейский режим держится не на одном Кемерсене, и что северокорейский режим не рухнет, пока там не появится свой Горбачев. И сказал, что в ближайшие 30 лет объединение невозможно. Это было 28 лет назад. Когда 10 лет назад умер Ким Чон Ил, сын Тимирсена, 
То есть таким же образом в Южной Корее были большие надежды на то, что вот идет молодой лидер, который не очень хорошо там понимает, и возможно, что тоже на И причем я хочу сказать, что и в России были некоторые люди, которые говорили, что в 2020 году начнется процесс объединения под агидой Южной Кореи и Северной Кореи потихонечку исчезнет от государства. Я тоже сказал тогда же, что это нереальные мечты. Я могу также сейчас показать, что в ближайшие 15-20 лет, я потом говорю, что мне осталось жить, наверное, примерно в ближайшие 15-20 лет, и поэтому я говорю, что в обозримом будущем, пока я буду жить здесь, на этом белом свете объединение Кореи не предвидится. По той причине, что у Северной Кореи, Южной Кореи нет адекватной соответствии их интересам стратегии объединения. Они являются политическими, идеологическими антиподами, и это очень хорошо подчеркнул господин Брин. И плюс к этому нужно отметить, что если Немцы разделились действительно в результате э, мировой войны, но между немцами не было крови. Они не воевали друг с другом. Корейцы же воевали. И кровь на них, на северянах и на южанах. И обе части Кореи друг друга не простили. И это создает огромную проблему, потому что примирение идеологически, политически невозможно по той причине, что обе стороны обвиняют друг друга в том, что они являются зачинщиками войны. И это живет до сих пор и будет еще жить. Это одна сторона дела. Теперь вопрос в том, как построить возможное сближение, возможное сотрудничество между севером и югом Кореи. Понимаете, какое дело? Я уже говорил, что идеологически, политически север и юг это антипод. Поэтому здесь не может быть какого-то общего, общего ну, или вернее консенсуса по тому, каким образом им объединяться. Конечно, высказывались мысли о возможном сотрудничестве. Но это э, пожелания, которые очень сложно реализуются. Плюс к этому хотел бы отметить, что э, поскольку идеологически и политически они не могут объединиться, может быть, можно сделать ставку на националисты. В принципе, да, Корея и Северная, и Южная Корея националисты довольно серьезные позиции занимают, и националистические чувства могут попробовать. Но дело в том, что этот национализм тоже имеет разные векторы развития. И он тоже не позволяет обе Кореи объединить на принципах этого национализма. И можно было, конечно, тоже попробовать в качестве объединительного какого-то идеи и принципа привлечь религию. Но опять-таки здесь мы сталкиваемся с тем, что северокорейское общество – это атлетическое общество, южнокорейское, и религиозным отношении оно разроблено. Там нет единой какой-то мощной религиозной структуры, которая могла бы объединить народ и стать привлекательной для Северной Кореи. И получается так, что и религия не может быть основой для объединения Кореи. И в этой ситуации, возможно, вот говорил, господин Брин говорил о ценностях, но когда речь идет о ценностях, то опять-таки надо иметь в виду, что, конечно, можно было бы на вот, основе консультантских принципов попробовать создать определенные ценности, которые были бы приемлемы для севера и юга. Но все дело в том, что из корейского общества, что дальше, дальше отходит от принципов консультантской морали, консультантских стандартов. И здесь, опять-таки, мы сталкиваемся с тем, что провозглашаемые сейчас э, э, там, лозунги о правах человека, 
это очень модное. Но дело в том, что вся, Северная Корея, всякие попытки других стран, других сил указывать на э, какие-то вещи, которые должны быть связаны с повышением прав человека, они воспринимают это как вмешательство внутренних дела. Но к этому, как вы знаете, э, нынешние упоры на права человека, они во многом расходятся с фундаментальными принципами демократии, потому что демократия – это право большинства. А нынешние права человека в большей степени ориентированы на права, на защиту прав меньшинства. И причем не просто даже защита меньшинства, а превосходство прав меньшинства над правами большинства. И это тоже фундаментальное развитие, которое существует в Северной и Южной Корее. И поэтому мне кажется, что то, что говорил господин Брин, о том, что надо дать возможность корейцев самим, самим, без вмешательства внешних сил, то, что они хотят делать и потихонечку начинать сотрудничество. Сначала торговля, потом экономическое сотрудничество и так далее, и так далее. Но это будет очень длительный процесс, и я не вижу другого пути для того, чтобы корейцы когда-нибудь могли объединиться. Несколько лет назад я высказал идею о том, что, возможно, Корея прошла от точки невозврата, и, возможно, никогда они не смогут объединиться. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I apologize for the delay there, but we wanted to make sure we heard the translation of your full speech. Very interesting points, taking the stance that reunification has a lot of challenges and in your view may not happen in 10 or 15 years. So really bringing to light the reality and the challenges of these two very different areas. So thank you, Dr. Kim. We are going to head over to Norway now to welcome Mr. Torbjörn Fervik. Torbjörn Fervik graduated with an MA in the Chinese history and has specialized in that area for most of his professional life. He served for over 25 years as a foreign correspondent and worked for many years as an international reporter for the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. He has authored 12 books on Asian history, including the biographies of Mahatma Gandhi and Marco Polo and numerous other works, including to India in 1999 and Mao's Kingdom in 2012 that won Norway's foremost literary award, the Bragg Prize. He currently works as a writer and freelance lecturer. Welcome, Mr. Fairvik. the floor is yours. Thank you so much, thank you. Well, in the Chinese Forbidden City, uh, Korea has been a source of concern for centuries. Uh, Koreans have tended to go their own ways without asking others for permission. In 1950, North Korea started a war, which in a sense is still going on. There is no peace agreement in sight, nor any reunification of the two Korean states. So why is it so difficult? There are many explanations. One is that China has lacked the political and military strength to impose its will. If the Chinese had tried doing so, there would have been uh, a new Korean war with heavy losses and an uncertain outcome. Another reason is Beijing's lack of trust in their Korean comrades. The style of politics in North Korea has by and large been more dogmatic than China's. And unlike China, the country is virtually closed to outsiders. The present leader in the North does not have a high standing in Beijing and in social settings. He is often uh, the subject of more or less funny jokes and uh, laughter. For some time after the Korean War, North Korea did better than its neighbor in the South. But then in the 1960s, South Korea's economy gained speed. After Chairman Mao's death in 1976, 
China was forced to look at the Korean problem with new eyes. It was all too clear that South Korea was an economic success, while North Korea was a failure. After several years of cautious warming up, the breakthrough between Beijing and Seoul uh, came in 1992. That year, the two countries established normal diplomatic relations. Since then, trade between the two has risen year by year, and today China is South Korea's most important trading partner. And even though political problems arise from time to time, it seems that Beijing is willing to let trade run its course. There is uh, no doubt that the Chinese leaders are impressed by South Korea's economic success. And uh, as a sign that the Chinese leadership is placing great emphasis on relations with South Korea, President Xi visited Seoul as early as uh, 2014, and a new visit is likely to take place soon. It is worth noting that he has not shown North Korea the same attention. His only visit so far uh, took place two years ago. Although Xi and Kim Jong-un spoke highly of each other and toasted eternal friendship, it seems obvious that China's relations with North Korea are essentially dictated by military considerations, geopolitics and duty. Yes, duty. Uh, DPRK, the Democratic Republic of Korea, was born thanks to China. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese fell on the Korean battlefield. One of them was uh, the eldest son of Chairman Mao. Therefore, there are strong emotional ties between China and North Korea. Keeping North Korea afloat is in many ways a big burden for Beijing, but the Chinese leaders feel they have no choice. He and his colleagues hardly dare to imagine what might, what might happen if North Korea collapses. In the worst case, millions of people will flee, most of them to South Korea, others to China. A complete collapse in North Korea would be a serious defeat for China, even more painful, painful maybe than the US defeat in Vietnam. A North Korean collapse could also pave the way for a unified country leaning towards the US and the Western world. There are so many uncertain factors here, and Beijing's, Beijing's cautious men are not likely to take any chances in a game like this. It goes without saying that China wants a peaceful solution in Korea, but he is in no hurry. The most important thing for him in this phase is to keep North Korea's economy alive, to slow down or at best to halt the country's nuclear program, and to moderate Kim Jong-un and his close colleagues. There is, as you know, no Korean dialogue at present. The six-party talks, which began 18 years ago, ended after six years, and there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Relations between China and the US seem to be going from bad to worse, and without their active participation, there will be no movement in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Fairvik. Very interesting uh, perspective, really looking at the situation of China, the power struggle that is happening there. And they're, they're trying to hold on to North Korea while still having power over the DPRK. Very interesting. Thank you so much. We're going to move over to the United States now and welcome our next panelist, Mr. Bruce Klingner. Uh, Mr. Klingner is a distinguished graduate of the National War College, where he received a master's degree in national security strategy in 2002. He also holds a master's degree in strategic intelligence from the Defense Intelligence College and a bachelor's degree in political science from Middlebury College in Vermont. 
Mr. Klingner served for 20 years in the Central Intelligence Agency and Defense Intelligence Agency, including as CIA Deputy Division Chief for Korea, responsible for the analysis of political, military, economic, economic and leadership issues for the President of the United States and other senior US policymakers. He is a frequent commentator in major American and foreign publications and a regular guest on broadcast and cable news outlets. outlets. He is currently a senior research fellow for Northeast Asia at the Asian Studies Center from the Heritage Foundation. Welcome, Mr. Klinger, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and someday, hopefully again in, in person. Um, the title of my the topic uh, is the trilateral alliance between the US, Japan and South Korea. And actually it's a misnomer because there is no formal military alliance amongst the three countries. Uh, of course, there's dialogue, engagement, economically, there's uh, military and security cooperation, but, but no actual alliance. So the relationship is, is triangular, but with two strong legs and one very weak leg. And the weak leg is between Seoul and Tokyo. The U.S. has very good relations with both of our allies, but unfortunately, the relations between our two allies has, has always been very strained. Um, and indeed, Seoul has promised China that it wouldn't in enter into a trilateral alliance with Japan after Beijing retaliated economically, after South Korea took steps to better defend its country and its populace against the growing North Korean nuclear and missile threat. Now, the, the strained relations are due to longstanding historic issues, centuries old, not just from the occupation by Japan of the Korean Peninsula last century. Uh, and and the, the relations have been cyclical. They usually go from bad to very bad. Uh, and currently, they're the worst I've seen in the 28 years that I've been focusing on uh, Northeast Asia. So the most recent iteration is, has been triggered by President Moon withdrawing from the Comfort Women Agreement, which was uh, an accord that both countries thought had finally resolved the, the issue of the Comfort Women from World War II. Uh, then South Korean court cases, then a Japan trade retaliation, South Korean threat to withdraw from the military and intelligence uh, sharing agreement, et cetera. So you know, both sides point their finger of blame at the other, and at various times, both sides have been correct. Um, in Japan, there's said to be Korea fatigue of uh, that Japan feels it's done uh, many apologies to resolve the historic issues, and South Korea keeps moving the goalpost. In Korea, there's Japan fatigue and that they feel Japan has not suitably apologized or taken steps uh, to respond to its very brutal occupation of the Korean Peninsula from 1910 to 1945. In, in Washington, there's Korea and Japan fatigue. Uh, right now, the U.S., or for many years, the U.S. is trying to get our allies to focus on the present day threats from China and North Korea rather than focusing on the, the threat from the last millennium. And quite simply, the US cannot defend South Korea without Japanese support. That's not only the seven formally designated uh, UN command rear bases that are in Japan, which provide uh, support for any kind of uh, conflict on the Korean Peninsula, but also the US would need access to other Japanese bases but beside those seven formally designated the bases. Um, and we need Japanese permission to use those additional bases. And we would also need Japanese military capabilities, protecting the sea lines of communication, not only from Hawaii and Guam to Japan, but from Japan to the Korean Peninsula, as well as uh, Japan has uh, very extensive mine clearing capabilities and, and other necessary capabilities during the conflict. And if bilateral relations between Tokyo and Seoul were very bad at the time of a conflict, Japan may decide not to assist or to allow uh, its bases for UN operations on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea has repeatedly threatened Japan with nuclear attack. They've developed uh, missiles and nuclear weapons that could annihilate Tokyo and other large cities. Uh, Pyongyang has engaged in military exercises where they've trained to do that and they've they've announced that they were practicing nuclear airburst attacks on Japan. So if the relations between the two countries were, were bad, it, it would seriously impede not only the United States, but the United Nations 
uh, from coming to the aid of South Korea during a conflict or potential uh, reunification scenario. And South Korea has allowed these historic animosities uh, to impede the current defense of its country and its populace on missile defense. And the, uh, it has refused to allow its what's called the Korea Air and Missile Defense System to be integrated into the broader, the more effective allied system of the US and South Korea. It, it's like a baseball coach telling his three outfielders, I don't want you talking to each other. And anyone who's played baseball knows that uh, the three outfielders have different perspectives on an outgoing uh, high fly ball or a missile. Uh, and you may think you're about to catch the ball, but your colleagues will say, no, no, it's gonna go over your head or it's gonna drop short. So if the three outfielders are talking to each other, if their communication and their uh, defenses are integrated, then you're more likely to catch the ball or intercept a nuclear tip missile. Uh, but South Korea has refused that because of the, the very strong historic animosities, uh, particularly from the occupation of the last century. So what is the role that the U.S. could play? Uh, that has ebbed and flowed depending on the U.S. administration. Uh, under the, the Obama administration, the U.S. was taking a very strong behind-the-scenes effort uh, to send actually quite strong, stern messages to both Tokyo and Seoul to try to push their focus toward the current and the future threats rather than past threats from the previous millennium. Uh, under the Trump administration, that those efforts were largely abandoned. And we have yet to see yet whether the Biden administration will pick up where the Obama administration left off. Uh, the Obama administration's efforts did lead in part to the Comfort Women Agreement. Um, and many of the people that were involved in that, uh, Tony Blinken, Kurt Campbell, and others, uh, are back in the Biden administration. So we're hoping that behind the scenes, the, the U.S. Will, will work and push and cajole uh, our two allies to work better together so that we can better defend not only South Korea, but also Japan against the North Korean and, and Chinese threats, uh, and also to work towards reunification. Now, we all, or I tend to focus on sort of the security aspects, the, the, the reunification or conflict on the peninsula. Uh, but even in a peaceful unification, if say the North Korean regime collapsed uh, and, and we could have a peaceful unification, Japan would be a critical component because of its very large, very strong economy. South Korea couldn't pay for unification by itself. Uh, the, the, the debt and the, the poor economic conditions in the North are just too, too bad. So Japan, along with the rest of the international community, uh, would be an obvious uh, participant in any kind of uh, rebuilding of the North Korean economy and, and country after a collapse. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Very interesting to paint the picture of this informal trilateral relationship, but particularly the responsibility of the United States to try to bridge the gap between these two nations in case of what may happen in the future to prepare for that. So thank you, Mr. Klingner. We are going to move on to our final panelists for this, and then we will now we will have Q&A after. And I want to remind our audience members to please use the Q&A function, not the chat function. It's a different button, the Q&A button, to be able to submit your questions for our panelists today. And now for our final panelists, I'd like to welcome Dr. Thomas J. Ward, who serves as the president of the Unification Theological Seminary and is a professor of peace and development studies. Prior to his current role, he served for 18 years as the Dean of the University of Bridgeport's College of Public and International Affairs, where he taught graduate courses in culture and development, peace and conflict studies, and political and economic integration. Dr. Ward has lived and worked in the United States, Europe, Latin America, and East Asia. He lectures in English, French, and Spanish, and has a working knowledge of several other European and Asian languages. In 2008, he was appointed as a member of the Connecticut Department of Higher Education's Policy Advisory Council on International Education and served in that role until 2011. He has been a Fulbright Scholar, a Taiwan Foreign Ministry Research Fellow, and a guest lecturer at the Academy of Social Science in Beijing and at Academia Sinica's Institute of Modern History in Taipei. Welcome, Dr. Ward. We're excited to hear from you. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to begin with a key word, which is not part of my, uh, my presentation. And the key word is ripening. And in any conflict, the point is that at some point, those involved in the, those engaged on both sides, they can come to the conclusion that uh, somehow the struggle, the conflict is no longer worth continuing to pursue. Uh, we're reminded of cases such as Anwar Sadat, who suddenly made the decision to establish diplomatic relations to the, to the shock of everyone with, with, uh, with Israel. We're reminded of the deaths of uh, um, Brezhnev, uh, Yuri Andropov, Konstantin Chernyenko, and suddenly the, 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 the appearance of, uh, of a um, Mikhail Gorbachev. Quite simply, things can turn very quickly and in ways that we may not, may not anticipate them to turn. So I, I just want to kind of preface it with that observation, and I'm certainly happy to, to explore it later if we have time. But I would like uh, now to share my screen with all of you. I did not want to do that. I'll try this one more time. OK. Uh, and my focus is to speak, of, speak about the Universal Peace Federation and interstate relations in the North Asia Pacific region. Uh, Taming Intractable Conflicts, a text uh, published by the United States Institute of Peace, um, speaks about uh, the civil war in Mozambique, which lasted between 1976 and 1992, which took, so, took the lives of some 1 million people. And when things began to ripen in that particular uh, conflict, the question came, who could be the mediator? Some thought maybe the United Nations, some thought Portugal, perhaps the European community, but none of those were acceptable to the two competing sides, uh, Renamo and Frelimo. Instead, to the surprise of everyone, the consensus was that they would turn their attention to a small religious order organization known as Sant'Egidio, which for many years had been performing different types of social services uh, inside of Mozambique, and both felt this is a partner whom we can trust. And the amazing thing is that basically Sant'Egidio, you know, kind of stepping back, pro providing a forum where the two parties could speak, somehow was able to serve as the vehicle through which in 1992, the General Accord for Peace could be established between uh, Mozambique and uh, I mean, between Frelimo and Renamo within Mozambique. Um, so since that time, Sente Gidio has been involved in the resolution of a variety of conflicts around the world. And my point today is maybe to suggest that it's possible likewise that an organization such as UPF can play an, uh, a significant facilitating role in terms of the circumstances of the Korean Peninsula, as well as the breakdown of relations among some of the secondary actors in this conflict and with Korea itself. So um, I think that you are aware that UPF consists of a variety of organizations in, in areas such as government and culture and media and uh, interreligious dialogue and in the dimension of uh, uh, development per se, and also heads of state. Um, but what I'd like to do rather than trying to dissect those organizations in the little time that we have is I'd like to pr pr provide a perspective on where the Korean, the Koreas and secondary actors in this conflict hopefully can be able to go. Um, some of you might be familiar with this. This is, this is called the curve of conflict. Uh, it was developed by Michael Lund from the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, there are different levels of conflict. Unfortunately, no time to talk about that today. Let me just differentiate between stable peace and durable peace. In a stable peace, for example, the relationship between the United States and Russia, there you can have trade, you can do a variety of things, but you know that there are certain things you can't talk about. In a durable peace, which, are, which is on the level, of, let's say US, Canada, we can speak about everything. So the idea is, is uh, as conflict step-by-step uh, step dissipates, you want to get to the point of a durable peace, but it's rare, but that's the hope. I'm fascinated by France 
and the reconciliation that occurred after World War II between France and Germany. Some of you might know this statue. This is a statue which you find in Strasbourg. And it's a, picture, it's, it's, a, it's a depiction of a mother with two sons, one who fought on the side of Germany and the other who fought on the side of France. And the interesting thing is that inscribed on this, on this particular uh, monument, you have the term mort pour la patrie, died for the country, without saying whether it was France or, or Germany. By the way, this was from World War I, this particular statue. But my feeling is that there's a remarkable model. If we see the process and the change in Franco-German relations from the time of Nuremberg to the time of Lisbon. And uh, I have to abbreviate everything here, but essentially, amazingly, between France and Germany, I think it, Germany, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that they're pretty close to having established a durable peace, having gone from war to a durable peace in this period of time. And so uh, my, my question really is, what about the Koreas. Maybe some of you have seen this film, The Tokyo Trial on Netflix. If you haven't, please watch it. It's, a, it's five episodes, very well done, very insightful. But one, when one sees this particular trial, one still gets the sense that Japan feels that they were somewhat the victim of, of the circumstance and what, what, what transpired after the war. Um, and if you visit the Yasukuni Kuni Shrine in uh, Tokyo, Tokyo, you will find that there's a monument there to judge uh, Rahabadinad Pal, who was the Indian judge who did not agree that the um, that the prisoners of war should be for, should be uh, I'm sorry that that any of them should be should be judged as having committed um, uh, war crimes. He did not concur with that. Korea-Japan relations on the Korea side also is not good. Um, we already heard a little bit of, of the, about that from uh, Mr. Klingner um, and the Comfort Woman controversy. By the way, I, I've written a book on that topic. I don't know how many people know, but in the United States, we have 15 Comfort Women statutes everywhere from Washington, D.C. to Virginia, to New York, to New Jersey, to Texas, to Michigan, to California. And those particular statutes, they, they convey the, uh, the, the narrative, if you will, of essentially the Koreans. And there's not much to be said about, about the, the Japanese side. I'm not saying that there's not issues that have to be brought up here and there are things that need to be settled. What I am saying is this is even in the United States that we're only hearing one side of the narrative somehow. Um, and I feel that this is one of the areas where UPF can make a huge contribution. When the, the Comfort Women controversy first came to light back in the early 1990s, it was around that time that uh, Reverend Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon began a bridge of peace ceremony, bringing together Korean and Japanese women. They would cross a bridge, they would embrace each other, and they would, they would establish a sisterhood. I'm sure that the intention behind that really was to, was to work in order to improve this relationship. And incidentally, within the unification movement, there are more, more than 5,000 Korean and Japanese couples, which means children born from that who are both of Korean and Japanese origin. Again, I think they can be a great resource in terms of being able to somehow foster dialogue between Korea and Japan. Um, following the meeting between Donald Trump and uh, um, Kim, Kim Jong-un in, in 2018, you may recall that for the first, that Korea canceled anti-US month. But they had actually done the same thing, canceled anti-US month in 1992 because of a track two initiative initiated by UPF and Dr. Sun Myung Moon and Mrs. Hak Jahan Moon. I was a part of that. There's not time to speak about it in this short period of time. But anyway, it was the first time that Anti-American Month goes from June 25th, the day when the Korean conflict began, until July 27th, the day of the armistice. And it happens every year. But in 1992, following Reverend Moon's visit there in 1991, and following uh, a, a visit of a, of a group of uh, former American uh, civil servants, public servants, a decision was made by the North Korean government to cancel this. Furthermore, Reverend Moon passed September 3rd, 2012. My point is he, he, met, he met Kim Il-sung in 1991. And between 1991 and 2012, 
there was exchange and, and, and uh, somehow, some type, somehow the channels of communication were kept open throughout that period of time. And on September 5th, at the time, two days after his passing, there was a flower arrangement sent to honor Reverend Moon, uh, which was sent by Kim Jong-un. And on September 5th, Reverend Moon was declared a hero of national reunification on September 5th, 2012, by the government of the DPRK. He never renounced his values. He never renounced his principles. He never renounced his commitment. But at the same time, he was able to build a friendship. And I think that this is an important channel going forward, an important channel when the ripening moment comes to be able to begin to facilitate uh, Korea-Japan Korea, Korea uh, relations and also North-South relations. And uh, that tradition that was set up by uh, Dr. Samyang Moon has been continued by Dr. Hak Jahan Moon up until today. So there is, there is a channel there. There's a lot more that could be said about it, but in this brief period of time, I can't say too much. So my feeling is anyway, that UPF is an important partner in this whole process of improving relations in Northeast Asia. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward, especially representing the UPF perspective and point of view and, and how to support the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. At this time, we're gonna bring on all of our panelists to have a discussion together. Uh, we had a lot of questions coming in and I noticed that Dr. Kim is doing an excellent job answering some of the questions that are coming in on the chat. So thank you for that, Dr. Kim. I'm gonna start with uh, Mr. Breen. So as you depicted during your talk today, the Koreans themselves resist unification because of their differing values. You pointed out that the values change over time and near the end, you made some uh, proposals of how to support this reunification. But can you think of ways that the two Koreas might move towards acceptance of such a common vision? What can be done there? Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is, you know, there've, there've been, there's been dialogue between North and South Korea for a long time now. Um, actually, it goes back to the early 70s when it began. Um, but it has always and it remains uh, basically on North Korean terms. When the North Koreans want to talk, we talk. When they don't want to talk, there's nothing we can do. You know, and being democracies, you know, Americans criticize whoever the president is for not doing the right thing. And the South Koreans criticize whoever their president is for being useless. Uh, but it's really the North Koreans <clears throat> who decide. And they've got themselves into an extremely difficult position. I mean, one thing uh, about this Korean situation to bear in mind is this is a zero sum game. These are two countries which both claim to be the real Korea. Right. And unless there's some, something really changes where they recognize one another, um, that is very, very different from two neighbors who don't get on. Um, and so I think we all know what has to happen is there has to be a Gorbachev uh, moment in North Korea, something that shifts them away uh, from the hardline uh, position that they're in. Uh, and I can't, frankly, I, can't, I mean, it's possible Kim Jong-un will wake up one morning and have a revelation, but I can't see it. I think he's got to go. Um, I can't see the grandson of Kim Il-sung really being our person to do this. So I, I think we sort of have to keep talking just to be nice. But um, as Dr. Kim said, this is going to take a long time, barring as Tom Ward said, the unexpected event. And in these things, the unexpected event could happen anytime. Um, yes. Just for, you know. Thank just, you. If I may just, if I may just sure. add very briefly, I you know, just reminded myself in 1992, um, I had dinner with five US diplomats and foreign journalists, and we all put a bet on when the date of unification and we brought out $10 Korean money, plopped it down. I don't know who took the money. I don't know what happened to it. Um, the most conservative person there was a South Korean journalist who bet uh, April 1995. 
Wow. You know, so back then we all thought it was coming. We all thought this unexpected event would be around the corner. And here we are 30 years later making the same bet. And we might well be making it 30 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Breen. I think Dr. Kim shares similar viewpoints in terms of when this may or may not happen. And Dr. Kim, can we also turn to you and ask you about the Russian point of view and perspective on North Korea. They once shared a communist ideology and now have different forms of government. What would you say is the perception of Russia by the DPRK now? Обратите внимание на то, что говорил господин Брин. Как вы думаете, почему на протяжении 50 лет все какие-то меры или встречи по взаимопониманию между Северной и Южной Кореей происходят только по инициативе Северной Кореи? Как вы считаете, от чего это происходит? Почему Южная Корея не может добиться того, чтобы ее какие-то проекты и так далее дошли бы, убедили бы Северную Корею в том, что надо их принять. Это же ведь очень важный вопрос. Понимаете, вот когда я разговариваю с северянами, у меня контакты хорошие с северянами и с южанами, поскольку я гражданин России и, и не принадлежу ни к Северной, ни, ни к Южной Корее. И я когда разговариваю с северокорейскими специалистами, дипломатами, учеными и так далее, вы знаете, о чем они говорят? Северная Корея единственная за последние несколько столетий, единственное за последние несколько столетий корейское государство, которое ни от кого не зависит. На территории которой нет ни одного иностранного солдата. Последний китайский солдат был выведен на территории Северной Кореи в 1958 году. И с тех пор там нет ни одного иностранного солдата. Там нет никаких иностранных совместных военных учений. И они считают, что они действительно представляют Корею. Действительно они являются самостоятельными, независимыми. И отсюда их отношение к Южной Корее как стране, которая не является самостоятельной. Вы же понимаете, какая вещь. Вот президент Мунжиин, когда он стал президентом, он обнародовал свою программу действий, и там же очень многие хорошие слова были. Соединение автомобильных дорог, железных дорог, северо-юга, строительство газопровода и так далее. Но даже для того, чтобы оценить качество автомобильных шоссейных дорог, чтобы понять, в каком они состоянии, Туда надо было ввести оборудование. Ну а ввести оборудование без разрешения американского командования нельзя. И они так и не сумели, южане, выполнить хотя бы даже эту работу. И северяне на это смотрят, говорят, ну что ж такое-то, вы все хотите, вы говорите, и не можете это выполнить. Как можем мы тогда с вами разговаривать? Это очень очень важная сторона дела. И они считают, северяне считают, что их убеждение, их политика имеет большую силу, чем политика Южной Кореи. Поэтому они не собираются отказываться от этой своей политики, своей идеологии. Вот это, мне кажется, очень важно учитывать тогда, когда мы оцениваем состояние корейских отношений. Спасибо. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Very interesting culturally, the ideology and difference in terms of how North Korea views South Korea as not being true Koreans. Very interesting there. How about Mr. Fairvik, if you'd like to add any comments to this, you're welcome to, but also if you'd like to include the uh, perspective of China, you mentioned you know, this slow, steady approach to dealing with North Korea from China. But uh, would you characterize it as strategic patience, or is there some next step that may be happening from China? 
Oh, you're muted, Mr. Feyerbeck, if you could unmute. That's it, yeah. You know, uh, many people, including myself, find it hard to um, understand why China hasn't been able to exert more pressure uh, <clears throat> on the re regime in North Korea. After all, China is vastly superior to North Korea. And um, the Chinese, uh, they provide North Korea with everything from oil to soap. And uh, in the last two decades, China has uh, become a far stronger player in the international arena. Um, the country's economy is said to be the second largest in the world, and its uh, military capacity has, been, uh, has become significantly stronger. But uh, maybe, although this may be good for China, it has also caused anxiety and um, insecurity in many countries, especially in Asia and in the West, maybe also in North Korea. Um, according to a recent survey by Pew Research Center, 76% of respondents in the US say they have a negative view of China. In South Korea, the percentage is 77%. And in Japan, it is as high as 88%. And I think these figures can be explained by um, China's failed international diplomacy in recent years. Uh, President Xi and his men are perceived by many as arrogant and uh, unwilling to compromise on important issues. And especially China's behavior in the South China Sea uh, well, it's, it's just one example. And this uh, deplorable development does not make it easier to establish a meaningful dialogue on Korea. So at some point, I think that China will have to uh, adjust its course uh, to reduce tensions in Korea, uh, in, in the South China Sea and uh, uh, elsewhere. I, will, I would also like to uh, point out that uh, China in the years to come, it seems that um, the Chinese will have to focus more on the South China Sea and Taiwan. And uh, as, it is, uh, as it is unwise to fight many battles simultaneously, a reduction of the tension in Korea um, would be to China's advantage. Um, whatever the case, a North Korea armed with nuclear weapons doesn't serve China's uh, interests in the, low, in the long run. So, in my opinion, China has displayed a remarkable patience with uh, the Kim dynasty, but I cannot explain why. Uh, very interesting. I see Mr. Klingner, you have a comment to make. I was coming to you next anyway, so perfect timing. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you know, when we some of the questions uh, that have been raised in the in the chat room, you know, ask you know what can foreigners of the EU or others do to help bring about unification? You know, in a way, we can't want more. We can't want unification more than the Koreans themselves. Uh, and a recent poll I just saw this morning has that uh, only twenty six percent of South Koreans are in favor of uni unification. 55% uh, simply want to live peaceably side by side with North Korea, uh, and many don't even think about North Korea. So what we've seen over the years is uh, slowly decreasing support in South Korea for unification. I think it went below 50% uh, during the Park Geun-hye administration, and, and it's ebbed and flowed, uh, but generally it's been a declining support. Um, it's generational. The, the, Largest support for unification is amongst the, the oldest generation. Uh, some who lived in North Korea before it became divided, you know, their, their families may still be there, though they haven't seen them in 70 years. Um, the, the least support for unification is amongst the younger generation. They are more uh, entrepreneurial. They're focused more on uh, economic uh, well-being, not only the country, South Korea's, but also their own. And they see unification would be you know, very 
uh, direly impactful on the South Korean economy as well as their own economy. So it, it's something that we all want to happen. I think any of us who have worked Korean issues, uh, it, it's not only an issue in our, in our mind, but it's in our heart. And, it, and we, we strive and hope for the unification of the Korean, the Korean people. But uh, unfortunately, there's declining support for it. Now, if there was a sudden collapse in, in, of the North, well, then of course, South Koreans would want unification. It's what I call the, the ugly baby on the doorstep syndrome. You may not want it, but once it's there, uh, you of course would bring it in and, and take care of it. So um, there's unfortunately not a lot of, of positive movement towards unification at this point, as the other speakers have pointed out. Mm. Well, Dr. Ward, I'm coming to you next to try to give us the the positive outlook on what could be done to support this unification of the Korean Peninsula. You, I know you didn't get to get through all your points. If you want to expand a little bit on how you feel organizations like UPF can support it and are important, or if you have thoughts on some other options or alternatives to be able to bring about some type of unification of the Korean Peninsula. Well, ultimately decisions, they have to be made by governments. They can't be made by, uh, by, um, by NGOs, those are decisions which are finally going to be, they have to be done by, done by government. So I think that what UPF is able to do is to, is to keep open lines of communication, be, being a good listener. And at the right time, if something comes up, it'll be possible to, to do something. I know that in the past, many times uh, uh, people that I know who are associated with UPF, they've been consulted by the State Department uh, well, how do you think we should, how do you, how do you take this? How do you understand that? You know, so I think that it, that they can be a resource in that way. And, and basically I think that, um, I, I think in another way, fr frankly speaking, is I, I believe that, that, uh, we can play an important role in terms of strengthening. It's a, it's a, it's a huge task. And, and I, and I very much appreciate what Michael Breen said of outlining the, the scenario of the different camps in, Inside of inside of Korea itself, and also what Mr. Klinger said about the weakness of the relationship between between Korea and Japan, but I think that's an area where we can also help. The reality is, the United States is is a democracy which respects rule of law, as does Japan, as does Korea. If there's not a unity among those three and India as well, then we we face some real difficulties because there is a voice for rule of law inside of China. But there's, an, there's another voice which seems to be the resounding voice nowadays, which is much more emphasizing, emphasizing the party. You know, we, 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 can, we can do what we can to facilitate relations so that somehow uh, Korea, Japan, and the United States can have a more cohesive voice for, for democracy, for rule of law. And I think that's a very important role that we can be able to play in terms of this process. At the end, finally, the ripening will happen because of some kind of, of change, either long-term or hopefully short-term. There'll be some, time, some type of a change and we have to be ready to take advantage of that. And that's why it's important for UPF to keep its channels open. Right. Yes, we've mentioned a few times in our session today, the possible event or moment where we have to be able to move quickly should it happen. So we're coming to the end of our session today. I'm going to come to each of our panelists for your concluding remarks, again, on this topic of competing worldviews concerning Korean reunification and how much they will be a factor in the outcome. If you can try to keep your remarks to one minute, as we'll try to end on time, I know that's difficult. But we'll come to you first, Mr. Breen, your concluding remarks. Oh, please unmute yourself, Mr. Thank okay, you. Okay, I've unmuted there. Oh dear, I've got to keep to one minute. All right. Um, let, let me make a slightly different point that I hadn't made before then in that case. Um, what I think is more important than pushing on unification of Korea, particularly as we're outsiders in a way, uh, is reconciliation between the two Koreas. Uh, we, we often use the words peace and unification in the same phrase. You know, we want peace and unification. In Korea. These things are in a sense, mutually contradictory, while there isn't peace and unification. For example, what I mean by that is that unification is an inherently aggressive policy. Unification means 
uh, your side is going to disappear. That's what it means to the, when I was talking about the values, you know, this is what it means. We do not want North Korea any of your values. And they say, we don't want any of yours. So when one side starts saying, we want to talk about unification, the other side checks their defenses. You know, what are they up to? But reconciliation is a different thing. You know, I'd like, to, I live in Seoul. Uh, actually, you talked about the Comfort Women statue. My office is right by that. I go past that every day. I'd like to better drive up to Pyongyang and have dinner there. You know, that sort of level of reconciliation, exchanges, freedom of movement, uh, and things like that, uh, and eventual peace. To me, that's the first step. Mm. Uh, and that's not, that's not impossible. So I'd like to leave you with that thought. Thanks. That's, that's great. Really fantastic, maybe more realistic next step to consider. How about Dr. Kim, what are your concluding remarks for today's session? Вы знаете, я uh, несколько лет назад, три uh, года подряд, проводил в Москве конференции с участием северокорейских, южнокорейских и российских ученых. И вы знаете, эти конференции прошли очень хорошо, они друг друга прекрасно понимали. Поэтому я считаю, что Самое лучшее, что мы можем сделать для Кореи, для взаимопонимания и постепенного движения или продвижения к объединению, не мешать самим корейцам между собой наладить отношения. Должны быть сняты все внешние давления на них. Что-то, понимаете, но Южная Корея во многих случаях, она, она просто не может выполнить те обещания, которые дает их президент, потому что существуют э, какие-то там э, проблемы с, со стороны внешних сил, которые не позволяют из корейскому правительству выполнять эти свои обязательства. Вот, например, президент Южной Кореи Мунтейн в 2019 году три раза говорил, мы в этом году возобновим работу Китайского промышленного комплекса. Три раза говорил. И он искренне этого хотел. Но так и не смогли сделать. И во многом это связано именно из-за внешнего давления. Поэтому я бы хотел, чтобы не было никакого давления. Пусть они сами между собой разбираются, сами между собой начинают торговать, потихонечку сотрудничать. Это, конечно, займет много времени. Very interesting. Yes, similar to some of the other thoughts shared today that let the Koreas work on it amongst themselves too. Thank you, Dr. Kim. How about Mr. Fairvik? Yeah, uh, I think when we discuss Korea and the prospects for peaceful reunification, uh, it's important to say a few words about the cult of personality in North Korea, uh, because when an ordinary human being like Kim Jong-un is elevated to Superman, to, good, to a godlike figure, any rational political discussion becomes impossible. Uh, Superman decides. And in such a culture, there is little room for compromise uh, because Superman cannot be wrong. He has seen the light uh, and therefore chosen his uh, course and he will stick to it. And everything else is a loss of face. Uh, the personality cult in DPRK, uh, DPRK began with Kim Il-sung and it has continued to this day. And the international communist movement has a long tradition uh, of personality cult, but North Korea stands out as a special case because it has be, uh, been going on for so long and because it is so absurd and harmful. And I think an important precondition for the cult is that um, part of the population is willing to keep it up. And in the DPRK, there is under the current Kim, a political elite that enjoys significant economic privileges due to his rule. 
So if the country is reunited, this elite has no guarantee that life will continue as before, the cards will be dealt again, and many people will experience a sharp drop in status and power, and Kim Jong-un will for certain lose his uh, exalted status and join the ranks of normal people. So this is why it is so difficult to imagine a reunification of Korea under the current regime in the North, uh, simply because Kim and company has too much to lose. Right. Right, very good points. Thank you, Mr. Fairvik. How about to you, Mr. Klingner? The longstanding US policy on reunification is that it's a matter for the Korean people. Uh, we hope it takes place under the precepts of Article 4 of the South Korean Constitution, that it's based on the principles of freedom and, and democracy, which exist in the South and don't exist in the North. Uh, in the meantime, the US military presence there, the alliance, the commitment uh, to deter and defend South Korea, uh, the alliance is playing sort of the same role as that I play as an overprotective father of a young daughter. Uh, it's fine for the Koreas to talk to each other. It's fine for the Koreas to go on dates together and perhaps eventually get married. But uh, we'll be walking three steps behind them with a, with a shotgun to make sure one Korea doesn't try to take advantage of our Korea. <laughs> you have some great analogies, Mr. Klingner. That was excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And finally to you, Dr. Ward, your closing remarks. Well, I, I, think, one, I think one area where, where UPF actually can be quite useful is, is giving some further thought to, there's this del delicate balance, nuclear weapons in North Korea, and human rights violations by, by the Kim regime. We have to, we, a decision has to be made about how that will be navigated going forward. You know, you can't have both. You, you, you can't think, okay, first of all, we're gonna take care of the nuclear weapons and then we're gonna deal with the human rights issue. Uh, I'm quite certain that that's, that's not gonna happen. You know, so really um, UPF is a right place to think about those type, types of issues and, and to, to make recommendations behind the scene about how, how best to proceed to get to where we want to go. Because the reality of a, of a nuclearized North Korea, which is so unstable, is a huge threat for all of us. We just have to recognize that. It's a huge threat for all right. of us. Right, it really is. And that's why this conversation is an important one. I wanna thank all of our panelists today. I know we could go on for another hour, but this was a very intriguing conversation. Thank you for your expertise and your time and your perspective. We're very grateful to it. And thank you to our audience members. I apologize we weren't able to get to all of our Q&A today, but hopefully we can reconvene at another time. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, afternoon, or evening, whatever it is. Take care. <clears throat> thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thank you very thank much, you. everybody. I know that uh, I particularly wanted to thank the American uh, team in UPF USA, Larry Moffitt, uh, Kaylee Michael Jenkins. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Know you have to move on now because you have your final your final session. So uh, yes. we'll leave you to get on and look forward to cooperation in the future. Yes, thank you so thank much, you. everybody. You. Great session. Thank you, thank you Kelly. Thank, thank you, David, you. for your questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great moderator. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.